Today, we are going to talk about probably one of the most common records for genealogy research and one of the least common records that I think we all wish that we had. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. Today, we have two new, brand spanking new quick starts for you. We have one by Jim and Michael called Deeds for Love or Money. I always want love. Don't you want deeds for love? And we have a special guest today. I am so excited to have with you to with us today, Anita Boyd from I'm saying one of my favorite besides my own genealogy groups in the country, the um Afro-American Genealogical and Historical Society of Chicago. They are like, I would say they're probably one of the most watchers and clickers of our newsletter for Genealogy Quick Start. So we definitely had to have one of their superstars on here. Her name, like I said, is Anita Boyd. And she's going to be talking about schooling and census chasing Caroline. And she's going to talk about a record that we all wish we had, school records. So it's so nice to have you here. You guys know what you're supposed to do in the chat. Let us know who you are, where you are, and most importantly, if you have a genealogy group that you are a member of or multiple, because we know a lot of you guys are genealogy junkies out there, but go ahead and put it in the chat and we will get to know you shortly. But first, I want to bring out my buddies. First up, columnist and editor. James M. Beidler. How you doing? I am well, Shamel. And of course, genealogy tip of the day, Michael John Neal. How are you guys? I'm I'm well too, or am I good? I can never keep I never keep those good. <laughs> Let's not go back to the grammar book, Michael. We are not going to go back to the grammar. <laughs> I just had a flashback. Let's, Speak let's just call you a featured speaker, but uh... <laughs> But going back to grammar school, you know, I've always wanted um, school records that I hear about. Have either of you um, have been blessed to have access to school records of your ancestors? Well, my snarky answer is that I've only looked up mine, <laughs> and, and that was and that was enough. But uh, seri seriously, I have I have looked at, done a little bit of delving around the what they call the poor school kids lists in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were appended to tax lists uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, up until uh, uh, the Public School Act, which I believe was in the 1830s. Uh, if, if parents couldn't afford to educate their kids, on the county level, they were supposed to have a fund to do that for them. And so this is a good, a good record because it's records of kids mm -hmm. and, and of, of uh, people from the <clears throat> poorer classes yeah. uh, who you would have uh, fewer records of. Michael, do you have you, um, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. Um, Jim, well, I'm really going to look into those. Michael, what do you have? You I've got two. I'll mention real quickly. I have all my mother's report cards from first grade through eighth grade signed by my grandparents um and that that's kind of a thing you're more likely to find you know if your person decided to keep them some didn't for obvious reasons the other thing i have which is which is really neat i've got the uh school teachers book from a one room schoolhouse from about 1900 to 1910 and my great grandfather is mentioned in there his siblings are mentioned in there how it was in my great grandmother's effects when she died i'm assuming because at some point when, her, when he grew up, he was on that school board, and somehow he ended up getting that great book is how I'm It sounds like church records. My great-grandmom was a secretary or whatever, and she had those, so that's why we don't have them anymore. But thank goodness you actually were able to um, keep them. So pretty cool, pretty cool, but we'll hear more about school records a little later. Um, so guys, you guys have this new quick start here. I love, love deeds. 
I was actually buried in deeds uh, recently. Um, I love going to the county courthouse and hanging out with the, with the deeds. It's also it's fun to listen on the current day stuff that's going on as well. <laughs> so let's look at your uh, title here. Deeds for love or money. So what does that mean? Well, I uh, to the, the nutshell I would say is that uh, we think of deeds as having, they do have probably more boilerplate than just about any other document, but that doesn't mean they're all the same. Uh, and there, there are um, different, different types of deeds that don't all convey the same types of rights. And uh, Michael's going to go into more, more details on what uh, some of those differentiation of rights are. And I have an example of uh, two deeds where two brothers in, in uh, well, one who's my direct line ancestor and one who would be like a fifth grade uncle, uh, how they were treated uh, uh, quite differently by their parents uh, in the in the deeds where they sold them property. Fantastic. So you guys ready for deeds right. for love? Uh, do, do we want to go over who's here? Who's no. here? Oh, no, no. <laughs> look, I told you I love comment, deeds, yeah. so I totally forgot about everyone else. And I was just really excited. So let's see who we have here. Yay, we have people. Let's see who was first. Who was first? Oh, our last special guest, Alvin, is here. Hello, Alvin in Garland, Texas. Special Great guest here. alumni. A yeah. Special guest alumni. I love that. <laughs> hey, Angela Allen um, of the number one group, AA. G-H-S-C, now in Houston, Texas. Hey, Judy from Chicago Land. Um, let's see, Green County, Wisconsin Genealogical Society. Hello, Gary Franklin from Toledo and of the Chicago group and of the Cleveland group and of Augs. I told you guys we have junkies here. Um, this is therapy as well. Hey, June Hall from Shaker Hikes and AAGS in Cleveland. Is that my my sound that sounds like that? I think it is. Yeah. Hello, Jim, Jim Setta from California. Guys, I'm so sorry about that. I'll try to figure it out in a second. I don't know. You sound fine to me. Oh, I do? Okay. No, I'm hearing the echo. I'm hearing the echo. Hi, Cassie. Hello, Sylvia. We have a lot of AAGS. So, Anita, are you a member of that group, too? Hello, Sylvia Rogers in Chicago. Cassie saying hi to June. Hello, Benita from Oriental, North Carolina. Hi, Jean from, um, she also says hello to Mike and Jim from AAGG, as well as Dean Henry from AAGG. Thank you guys very much. Let's go ahead and get started with the quick start. All right. Step one for deeds for love or money. Step one is to obtain a copy of the deed. And, in, and I should point out in most cases, this is going to be the recopied version of the deed in the, the deed books at a county courthouse. Uh, you might be fortunate enough that you'll get the original original. Uh, but uh, but generally, what more than more than probably many records, uh, what we're working with are the ones that are recopied. Now, the most recent ones, a lot a lot now are either digitally derived or they just photocopied them into it. But as you get back further, it was some guy who got writer's cramp, right, writing out the deeds that were brought into the courthouse to be recorded. So where do we get the deeds from? Are well, they available we, online or what's going on with those? It's, it's going to be hit and miss. Quite a few of them are on family search. Uh, these are the ones that we're talking about are going to be county type records. In most parts of the U.S., there are a few locations where these are town records and you would want to see what's what's applicable to your to your jurisdiction. But most of the time it's at the county level, typically in the recorder's office. And that's a really good we think about the root word there is record. What we're using is the record copy of the original deed, as Jim alluded to. This record copy, whether it's hand transcribed or 
mechanically reproduced in some other way is the legal equivalent of the deed. It, just like today, you want to get your deed recorded so that if you lose it, there's a copy in the courthouse recorder's office that is the legal equivalent of that original document that was uh, that was signed. Um, and that that's what we're using. There, a lot of them are on family search. Some, particularly if it's after the 1900 or so, you'll probably most likely have to go to the county to get those to get those records. But I would start with family search as the place to, to begin with. And and I, and furthermore, modern ones, a lot of counties have digitized those deeds. Don't worry, it wasn't for us to help help genealogists out. <laughs> it's just these are needed for the title searches uh, for pro when properties are are bought and sold. And so so therefore, they know that they know they can get money out of the title searchers, um, and therefore have a lot of counties had digitized them. But and just because the yeah, that. just. Just because the counties digitize them doesn't mean you're going to be able to get them for free, like at Family Search. Um, for more recent ones, you might even have to pay. For example, I wanted to find a relatively recent thing for a, for a personal reason. I had to pay to search by name to get the document number, and then I could click on the document and, for another fee, get a copy of that of that record. Um, I've been to other places where it was all free, and you just had to use. The index is online, but it's it's going to vary depending upon the county's philosophical viewpoint of how they want to do that. Yeah, I didn't realize how lucky I have it. Berks County, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, your your log on is free, and uh, you can uh, you you can screenshot stuff if you want an actual copy. Then you pay like a buck a page. Five cents a page, but you have to be in the place to get it in my county. Okay. All right, guys, let's move on to step two, which is to understand the parts of the deed. So I think Michael has these great slides to talk to us about parts of the deeds. So here we are almost. And there we go. Maybe Just keep in mind when when these pop up, we're we are generalizing quite a bit nationwide. But usually, these are the key elements that are in uh, that are in a deed. The grantor is the sell or. I'm mispronouncing that incorrectly on purpose because grantor, the sell or, and grantee, the person who is receiving title, are, are the individuals involved in the the land transaction. And so you, you want to keep those straight. There's going to be a grantor. There's going to be a grantee. There may be more than one of those individuals, depending upon the situation. And the, the third item that's listed is the consideration. That is how much, if it's a cash transaction, that's how much money uh, exchange hands for the property to be acquired by the grantee. We made the joke in the title for love or money. Some deeds are done because cash was paid sometimes property is transferred due to some relationship where there's no cash and they just say love and affection there may be a token amount of dollar five dollars but there has to be some consideration not necessarily cash but some consideration will have to be have to be listed and the one in the example here the consideration if you read that is is five hundred dollars the illustrations are this is not the record copy of a deed these are actually images made of a deed that i purchased on ebay an original the actual original deed that was where the uh, grantor was the first cousin of an ancestor you ready for the next part yeah go ahead i want to apologize to everyone for this sound i have no idea how to fix it this is the um, another one of the key elements, the legal description of what land is being transferred. Now, this is in Illinois, which is a, a federal land state, so we've got quarters and sections of townships. If this was on the East Coast or in those areas of the United States where we have meets and bounds, then it would talk about trees and fences and waving at lines and cricks and rivers and all that kind of kind of thing. But the, the deed has to describe the property being transferred. That's one other one of those key elements of the deed is where the property's at. Then we've got to have the grantors, the sellers have to sign it. 
and there's usually at least one witness witness to that document how many witnesses you have to have for it to be legal can be different from one different place in one different time period at this point in time one witness was good enough we've got the, in this case the husband and the wife have both signed off on this signed off on this d james and and margaret there but because this is the original deed these are their original signatures the record copy jim mentioned those clerks getting writer's cramp in those old record books where it's not um electronic reproduction michael yes i'm gonna go to jim's deeds can you okay. go out can you leave and come back i can do that i can do that thank you <laughs> Maybe I'm we've, been doing, we've been doing this for three years without a hitch and now all of a sudden there's some hey uh yeah go, go to mine and and, and just uh before that because he was talking about how that that original deed has the original signatures whereas in the in the um uh deed book it's going to be recopied but i know i know from doing a lot of work with with german ancestry that a lot of times the clerks would try to imitate the Ger German script if that was the ethnic oh. uh, persuasion, and and that's how and that's how you can a lot of times determine if it's a, if it's a name that can go you know could be English or could be German if you see the clerk trying to imitate uh, the cursive script scr scratch chicken scratch then you know it's actually a german so you know just a just a tip there but yeah these are the two um uh, first of all this this one is um of my fifth great grandfather conrad Beidler, uh who built a, a stone miller's house that's still standing in, in berks county pennsylvania oh uh, and he um oh uh, he just a few years after building that stone miller's house he sells it to his oldest son john or johannes beidler uh, and and it's interesting that john was the eldest son oh uh, and he paid a, a pretty penny i don't know i i don't know for sure is was oh, it actual a thousand dollars back in 1787 1500 pennsylvania pounds yeah yeah so um you know that you know that that and, and that was typical a lot of times that um, the oldest son would you know not inherit uh, the home property would would instead would um, buy it uh, and or or if if the uh, father wasn't selling uh, at at that time they would help the older sons uh, buy a farm uh but th then a lot of times count that against their inheritance uh oh. later on yeah okay. so so this is uh this is conrad to john uh his eldest son and if we go to the next slide uh we have uh conrad and his wife barbara uh to peter Beidler, who's my actual fourth great grandfather actual ancestor and here uh this is this is another this is another farm that conrad bought after when he essentially moved off the 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 mill property uh, and here he says in consideration of the natural love and affection blah 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 and five shillings a, a nominal amount uh, essentially the equivalent of of like a quarter or something like that <laughs> uh, that um, uh, they give Peter the younger son young guest son mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this again was a traditional German thing 1700s into the early 1800s where the youngest son was really expected to stay behind uh, and care for his, his parents in their old age and then he would get the farm for the nominal amount, the oh. homestead. Yeah, it's different than a lot of a lot of people think. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, that that and this, uh, well, Shamel, as you know, I've been to the the Bidler house, the one that John Bidler got, 
Uh, actually, I've never been this. This house is also standing on the property that Peter, oh. owned, but I haven't been there. I did the the uh, I was you know trying to get there, and then of course the pandemic happened, and that's still on my list to uh, to get to that house. It, it's now it was a farm, but now is in the middle, uh, not the middle of the city of Reading, but it's it's within the city boundaries of Reading. Well, I want to go too. So should we let Michael come back? Well, let's Mike. Let's let Michael come back. Yeah. <laughs> Don't start any trouble, Michael. Let's see. In five, four, three, and Michael is back. Let's see. Well, Michael? let's see. I got rid of the cat. I don't know if that helped or not. I is it better? It's better, but I think it's still there. Let's try. Let's go back hmm. to where you were. You did the signers, and I think we were now on acknowledgments. Yes. So let's share that. Not only would they have to sign it, they would have to, as it mentions on the overhead, acknowledge it in front, usually in front of some public official, a notary, a justice of the peace, or in some locations in open court. Um, these individuals, I believe, uh, did it in front of a justice of the peace, if, mem yeah, if memory serves. Um, but that was just to the, you know, a, one more additional guarantee that it was a legitimate actual transaction. Um, to kind of ensure that a little bit. So the acknowledgements are there. Sometimes we look at these because this can be a residential clue. If there's no other place in the document that mentions where the grantors live, then the location where they're acknowledging it can be a clue. Particularly if they have moved further west and are selling, they don't sell the property right away, where they acknowledge it, that location can be a clue as to where they're living at that at that point in time so you, you want to look at those and the last part of it should be one more slide there the uh, fact that it was recorded um, this is at the bottom of the record copy of the deed in the courthouse there'll be a no day and time it was recorded today if you have your deed recorded they'll stamp it and write in the specific details of the date and time it was recorded this was what they did in 1855 or six, whatever that is there. I can't see that they would take this and in this case it was glued to the original deed that on june 15th of that year in book 57 on that page was the actual record copy of that deed this was so the deed holder knew where it had been recorded uh, when it was recorded all right michael we are gonna have to let you go dude <laughs> <laughs> let's see all right sorry about that that's okay you can go away and come back again one more time you could try it i'm gonna let you go <laughs> 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 sorry about that um michael had a lot more slides <laughs> Well, right. I can I can try to narrate them if you want me to. But sure. let's bring up. Um, he was going to talk about the types of deeds. So let's yeah, that yeah, yeah. And this is just you know going going over that you know depending on the the legal quirks of some of these particular situations um, that um, uh, you know they. It lists the peculiar, the peculiar circumstances that we're we're uh, we're talking about here, um, and yeah, the mortgage, the release, the quick claim, um, and as he points out, sometimes not all property transactions are together. Sometimes there's there's the book of regular deeds, there's a book of quick claims, uh, definitely books of mortgages. Uh, and oh, their yeah. their releases the, those are usually usually separated out now uh, in in some Pennsylvania counties they they have these books marked miscellaneous in the recorder of deeds office miscellaneous is like the juiciest part of any record well it could be very juicy yeah <laughs> yeah but there's a whole grab bag of things in in those um and uh, in, including um Oh, you know, support for a male bastard child. I found that in one, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> All right. I think he also has fee simple versus life estate. Yeah. Yeah. For a, a fee simple means you get all the rights and, and 
you can go to town. And both both of the Bidler examples I gave you are actually fee simple, even though one was charging a market price and the other was charging love and affection. Uh, but he's contrasting that to uh, to life estate uh, where you can use it, uh, but you can't sell it, can't mortgage it, can't uh, bequeath it. Uh, and this a lot of times is set up in in uh, people's wills. Uh, and then when when that person dies, usually a widow, uh, then there's a final settlement of the estate and then the property gets passed on at that point. OK, OK. And then we're back to Conrad Bidler. So let's run through the steps again. Oops. Let's run through the steps. So we have two. So we understood the parts of the deed. And um, we were talking about the type. So you want to determine the type of transaction and title. So that was mm -hmm. what we were talking about, whether it was a quick claim, et cetera. Yeah. Yep. OK. And so then step four is to um, what was the consideration? And that was the money or love. Oh, or love or, or uh, you know, some commodity, something like that. Uh, but yeah, deeds are contracts, and one of the basics of contract law is that if there's no consideration, it's not a valid contract. So that's why there's always because you might think, you know, what, why are they even putting the for a, for a dollar? Or yeah, a I always wonder in. why they put the it's, dollar. It's because you got because it's not a valid contract unless there's a consideration. Okay, yep. so you got to have a consideration. Mm -hmm. and, and then step five is to understand the terminology. So that's kind of what Michael went through, sellor, grantor. I always used to get those uh, kind of mixed up, but I think I got them now. Is there <laughs> anything else you wanted to share about deeds before I run through all the steps? Tim? No, not really. Let's let's show on because I'm, I'm anxious for us to get to Anita. So. <laughs> all right. So deeds for love or money. First, you want to obtain a copy of the deed. Step two is to understand the parts of the deed, like they said, boilerplate, boilerplate. Step three, determine the type of transaction or title. Step four is to understand the consideration. That can give you lots of clues on relationships often. Step five is then to understand the terminology. And... Uh, there's books out there that help you with that. What was what's that? What do they mean by that? And uh, there's a lot of cool books out there to help you with terminology. Thank you, Jim, coming from the Genealogical Society of Pennsylvania Library. Have a great day. Okay. Let's see. How do I get you out of here? Bye. <laughs> okay, guys, the person you have been waiting for. Um, our special guest. Let's get ready for her. Give me one second. All right. Welcome to our second quick start with our special guest, which I'll bring out right now, Anita Boyd, family historian and blogger of the Oak County in Mississippi. <laughs> Hello, Anita. Thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing, Jamel? I am doing well. Anita, we'd love to ask our special guests, how did you get started in genealogy and when did you know that you were hot? In 2006, I saw Henry Louis Gates' uh, series, African American Lives, and I asked myself, I think I can do, I told myself, I think I can do that. And then once I started researching, when I, I, when I uh, discovered the family secret, which was my grandfather's grandfather's family enslaved my grandfather's grandmother's family. That's when I knew I was hooked. That is incredible. What a story that is. Your family owned. That's why I love genealogy, because when we read history books, we're hearing about a mass of people. But when you get into the, the nitty gritty of it and the individual, the personal stories, they are so varied that it's just mind blowing and it's an, it's enjoyable. So I'm really excited to hear your family story that you're working on so far. Um, let's get the title out here. 
and that is Schooling and Census Chasing Caroline. Who was Caroline, Anita? Caroline is my great, great grandmother. Okay, okay. And I've been chasing her for 16 years. <laughs> They'll do that to us. They'll do that to us. That's true love right there, Anita. So let's go ahead and get started with your quick start. Are you ready? I am. Let's you do guys this. ready for Anita's quick start? Let's see. We have lots of comments. Let's see if they are saying hello to you. Let's see. They're saying thank you. And we have Terry Burks here from Columbus, Ohio. I hope I'm going to see you soon, maybe. All right. So. Let's get to step one of schooling, census, and chasing Caroline. Step one, interview your family. So who was your star interview that you, you know, when you got started? That would be my Aunt Ruby. And I think you have a slide of her. Yes. And in fact, um, Aunt Ruby was my go-to. She's my father's eldest sister. And when I wasn't talking to her, I was talking to her husband, who's from the same town <laughs> as my as as my as my dad and so between the two of them you know i started researching the family i started researching the in-laws i started researching the outlaws and aunt ruby told me lots of information in fact the first thing she told me when i asked her about her grandfather she said he was a tall man like daddy <laughs> and so i and and so she referred to him as papa and then she said um but and when i asked her what was his name she said she didn't know she didn't even know that he was a senior then I asked her, uh, then she continued and she said, I remember there was a Mary and a James. I used to have a picture of him, but I can't remember what happened to it. And then she decided to tell me about Papa's father. And, you know, here I was, I was ready to give this man the, the uh, Father of the Year Award. Um, at the same time, AAGHSC was about to publish a heritage book. And so I wrote an article about Papa's father. And, and then she dropped that last one on me. He didn't like the way she was raising them and took them from her. Her would be Caroline. Yes, exactly. So if you can go to the next slide, I want to give you some details because you, you're not going to believe this. Okay. Okay. So what you have here. Oh, hold is on, hold on, hold on. Uh -huh. That's the next step, I yep. think. Search foundational records, exactly. Search exactly. foundational records. So we're talking census records in this mm -hmm. case. Okay, mm -hmm. let's take a look. Okay, so you have the 1900 U.S. Federal Census for Octobaha County B2. And in that yellow, uh, yellowish greenish area, you have a Margaret Bingham. She's ahead of her household. Um, and then living with her is a son and daughter-in-law, Will and Minnie Bingham. And then you have a Robert Boyd, who's a grandson. And then you also have a granddaughter, Maggie Brown. Below her, you've got one of her, got her son-in-law and her daughter, Doc and Josephine Henderson. Below that, you've got a uh, James L. Boyd. And if you just do a cursory view of this page, um, can you find the column with the colors? With all the Bs? Say that again. So look for the column with the color, the race. Oh, color, color. Okay, mm -hmm. yes, yes. So all you see the all these Bs, right? Yeah, but one then W. Then you look at this James L. Boyd, and you've got this very faint W. Yeah. A white male. March uh, 1824 was when he was born, and he's 76 years old, and his status is WD. He's Widow. widowed. Okay. But if you look at the makeup of his family, you've got Garfield, who's a black male, male. Mm -hmm. okay you've got a black daughter-in-law and you've got a black grandson mm. okay. below that him you've got a george boyd he's the head george. of his family with his wife rebecca and a daughter named lily and below that you've got another bingham a lizzie bingham who is caroline's sister she's also the sister of josephine henderson that you see above okay 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 so what you can't see on this particular page is that he's renting land. And my question was, okay, this man is 76 years old. I suspect that he's a slave owner or was okay. a slave owner. So my question is, why is he renting land? And who is he renting land from? Um, if you can go to the next slide, I, I wanna, as I was going through this, I was like, this is driving me nuts. 
Because okay, so this is so this is going beyond foundational records here. Can you just first, um, I think, talk about how you got to this next record? Because you said you searched for foundational records, and then you did kind of like a survey, or did this record just? I this look for you did the survey. And, I look for anything and everything related to the county. There was no rhyme or reason. I'm looking for anything that's related. So let's to talk our about county. how you did that. So step three is to survey the records for the county. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? Because this is where people get stuck. They don't know where to go. So how do you know where to find the records for the county? So, in fact, when I started, I got a lot of help from other people that were researching boy collateral families. And so most of them were white. And so being in that time frame, I knew I should be looking at the Civil War. In fact, I had just completed a Civil War class, a year long Civil War class. And that's when I just started looking around. Um, and then, um, but I wait. decided to go to my local family search center now, okay. which, is, which is now called. And yeah. then I just started ordering microfilm from Salt Lake city. Okay. I so you looked on familysearch.org to get, to get microfilm. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Fantastic. So let's take exactly. a look at this cool, um, record that you've got. Yeah. And this is the Confederate pension application for a James L. Boyd. Um, and so where did you get this at? So at the time, I actually tried to request it through uh, the National Archives. But, you know, at the time, I should say Fold 3 or Fold 3, okay? They mm -hmm. did not have Confederate pension applications online. They only had Union. Right. So I I was went to Washington, D.C. to look at some family letters, some Boyd family letters, as mm -hmm. well as his application to the Southern Claims Commission. I'm just not going to be discussed here. And I came across this. Okay. Okay. So what you see here, over on the right-hand side, that fourth question from the bottom says, are you married or unmarried? unmarried. And he says he's unmarried, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you go down to that second section, the fourth question from the bottom, it says, uh, is the person that you're living with a, rela a relation? He doesn't answer. Mm. And below that, he says something. What is the re what is the relationship? He says, I have two sisters. Mm -hmm. Now, this is in September 1900 when he fills this out. That okay. sentence was taken in June 1900. Mm -hmm. So which is it? Is he widow? Or is is it? <laughs> okay. is, is, I guess it depends on if you're giving information to the federal government versus the state. <laughs> and I guess because the local government is providing you with a pension, a pension, I guess you're going to say what they, what they need to hear. Exactly. So basically what you did is you, you didn't just find your people in the census and keep on running. You looked around the census and you noticed this guy, white guy in the middle of all these black people, and you started researching him is how you came to this Confederate pension. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, you don't see it on this one, but on a, he has two other applications. He's got 1895 and he's got 1898. Okay. 1895 and the 1898 census, um, Confederate pension applications. He says he's renting land from a Joe Bingham. My question was, why is a former slave owner renting land from a former slave? There have to be some kind of ties. Okay. And that's so where I was do? going with this. Okay. So what'd you do next? So the next step is to continue looking for records. I'm still, I'm still looking for records here. Um, in fact, you really have to know what happened when. Maybe you want to create a timeline for yourself. I had all kinds of documents and I placed them in order like I was reading a book. Mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. so I could understand this. Okay. Okay. So, so that's where I was. So as you mentioned, one of the not everybody has access to these probate records for their family, but this one I found early on and it opened up, I'm going to say a can of worms. Okay. Because then it really started making sense. And this one is the inventory and appraisement of the estate of John McDowell of Octavia County. Okay. And what you see here, you've got his four matriarchs, Easter, Harriet, Dolly and Polly. And you've got three men at the bottom who I've not been able to identify the relationships. Um, but in that yellow section, you've got a Harriet from Harriet to Harriet. That is my family. 
that eight-year-old Caroline, that's the Caroline that I've been chasing for 16 years. Okay. So how did you know that this is your family? So what I had to do is I had to, so as I'm working, as I'm going backward, I'm also going forward. You know, research is not linear. Everything's exactly. not going to be in order for you. You have to figure this out and you have to work it forward. And what I did is looking through the neighborhood, I started placing names with these people. I focus in on the women with children's names. And if the children's names match the woman with a certain surname, I knew that. So for example, Harriet, who is superannuated, by the way, and I'm in that category too. I have no value because I can't have children, mm -hmm. according to this estate. Mm -hmm. So Harriet took the name of McDowell, which was the name of the slave owner. Um, Frank, he took the name of Adger. The Adgers were the Boyd's neighbors back in South Carolina. Then you have okay. Joe to Harriet. They took the name of Bingham. Below there, you have Dolly. Dolly took the name of Adger too. And I just started working through the census and looking at names, gathering those surnames, mm -hmm. really getting to know mm -hmm. the neighborhood. Then there's the Lindsay's, Elliot's, McNichols. So that's what I did. That's okay. So you um, focused in on John McDowell and you used the people from um, his inventory and matched them up with 1870 census and other, other records. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trace um, exactly. Exactly. Fantastic. Let's take a look at your, looks like you have an 1880 census mm -hmm. here. So what you look at, and it's a little difficult to read, but that first uh, family there is Joe Bingham with his wife, Margaret, Mary L, Josephine, Lizzie, and Ella. And some of these names you've seen before in that 1861 warrant of appraisement by John McDowell. Mm -hmm. Okay. But right below, you've got a J.L. Boyd and in the household is a Caroline Bingham. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it says servant. Now this is servant. the bottom of the page. Then okay. you work your way to, you go turn the page there and you've got these two mulatto children, mm -hmm. Lily and John. Lily is three and John is three months. And so if this is done in June, uh, it says John is three months, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But then again, looking at different records, if you look at the 1885 census, okay, two things should, should, uh, should come to focus. So you've got um, Joe Bingham and you've got Josephine and Lizzie and Ella. Then you've got two addi additional children, Jim and Ben, who weren't on the 1880 census or mm -hmm. I OK, but below there, you've got Caroline Bingham and she's got a son, a son named George. What happened to Lily? Mm -hmm. So now I've got a window when I think Lily may have died between 1880 and 1885. But my question was, just George Bingham, where did he come from? Well, it looks like his name was changed when I check his 1918 War one draft registration, it says he's born in March, 1880. When I check his death certificate, it says his wife, Rebecca, says that he's born in March, 1880. Uh, I also had another record. Um, can't remember what it was. So can we go back to this children's list? Yeah. Tell me about it and tell me where you, um, where you found it and how people can access it. And is this is this specific to your county? Is this specific to Mississippi? And what this, is educatable? <laughs> okay, so this is a record that's unique to Mississippi. The only other one that I've seen this early on is Oklahoma um, before 1900. So this was a this was um, through Family Search. I found the 1885. The 1878 is actually at Mississippi Department of Archives, and. Eventually, they made that available to be transcribed. But the problem that I discovered was, you know, it's great to have people transcribing documents, but if they're not familiar with surnames, you're going to have a problem. Sure. So some, so I'm going to say 24, uh, 2014, 2015, I finally, when I was at the archives, I kept asking to see this and said, oh, you know, it's available on uh, Family Search. I said, yes, I know. And I'm sorry to say. Many of the names have been tra uh, mistranscribed, and I really like to index it myself. Do you mind? And that's how I did the 1878. But I so, mm -hmm. so one asked, "Are your where your um, Binghams from? Are they? This is they're all Mississippi, right? 
Binghams are there in Mississippi. So okay. I've only been able to trace them back to 1870. Now, the Boyds come in about 1834, 1835. I'm still working on the Binghams. I have some Binghams that left Mississippi and came up to Illinois in 1860s. So maybe they maybe they were part uh, maybe he was enslaved by them at one point, I don't know. I'm still I'm do, still doing a survey of surnames. So you want to talk to us about this as a state? Yes. So um, what you're looking at, so I'm not sure I mentioned it, but Margaret Bingham on that 1900 census, it said that she had 11 children of whom eight were still living. If you count over on the right hand side, that 19, the spreadsheet there, you've got Caroline Bingham sort of in blue and you've got Eleanor Bell in blue. And because Charles Bell, her, um, uh, Eleanor's a husband is mentioned that tells me that she's died she died okay mm -hmm. but if you so and then you see the same thing with caroline's children you've got george garfield and robert if they're listed that tells me that she's died that she died okay especially so now i've got a window 1885 to 1900 when she could have died but if you continue on okay so caroline ellen elnora margaret harriet um Doc Henderson, who purchased the land from a Lou Kennard, and Lou Kennard is Mary Lou, another sister. Then you have Josephine, um, Doc Henderson's wife, Lizzie, Ella Joyner, James Bingham, and Will, Will Bingham. That's 10 of the 11 children. That's mm -hmm. why I say that she had to have died in this time frame. And what's amazing is I came across a record, don't remember exactly what it was, but they were asking um, Uncle George or Uncle Garfield, how did you acquire your land? And he said, I acquired it from my mother. Now, how is that possible, late 1800s, that you're acquiring land from a former slave? And, you know, it's, it's interesting because in Mississippi, women could own property in their own right in up to, um, as early as 1839. So and I so this Lizzie Jones is the one who was where he got the property from? So Lizzie Jones is a sister. So there's 11 siblings okay. and Lizzie Jones is just one of them. So if you look okay. at this here, so you've got um, the three boys who are inheriting from their mother's estate. Mm -hmm. Then you have her sibling, you have Caroline's siblings. And Mary Lou, she's actually up in Vancouver, Washington, but she's selling her property to Josephine, Josephine's husband, her brother-in-law. Okay. And so that's how I know um, that's when, when Carolyn had to have died. And where did you get this plat from? This was in the chance record. Um, in fact, I had actually found this about two years ago. And I've just been sitting on this, trying to figure <laughs> out what, what is this? What am I looking at? And I still have to transcribe the whole document because it is several pages. But I said, <gasps> and did you get this from Family Search? This is from Family Search. Yes. Okay. Family search is the best. And I'm sure you didn't get it by putting Lizzie Jones in the first name, last name box, right? Shamal, what did I tell you? I look, <laughs> I look page by page by page. Usually in the middle of the night when I can't sleep, I said, oh, let's see what I can find today. And yep. that's, that's how I did that. So let's that's take a I look at this record here. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the draft cards that you were shown. Talking yes. About so, earlier. so let's talk about some insights and epiphanies that I had. So, like I said, what makes this interesting is these three men: George Boyd, Garfield Boyd, Robert Boyd, my grandfather. They're all listed in the blue there. It says farming and it says landowner. The chief mm. registrar for Beat Two listed all of them as landowners. Mm -hmm. And I just took it for granted. I just okay, we got the we got land early on. But now that I know because of that plat map of 1907, yes, that now makes sense why, why they're landowners. And if they're landowners, they don't have to go to war because their 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 profession is crucial to the war effort. Ah. Okay. So W.W. Garth was unique in that in this particular area, B2, which is on the eastern side of the county, uh -huh. any person that was a landowner, he made a note of it. And I said, thank you, W.W. Garth. I really, appreciate <laughs> I really appreciate you doing that. No, that's great. That's great. But it gets yeah. better. Go ahead and go to the next piece there. 
Okay. What's interesting is, like I said, these are illegitimate children, right? Mm -hmm. I talked to a lawyer down there, and he told me that uh, illegitimate children... Go back for a second. Oh, okay. Hold on. He said illegitimate children could not inherit from the father until 1980. Well, actually, you can see it's September 12th, 1978, and it says an illegitimate child can inherit from both parents in the same fashion as a legitimate child, but... The father right. has to acknowledge him in his lifetime or the court would have had to uh, found reason for them to be the child of this father. Okay. So that's what makes it unique. And that's why I say that they inherited from their mother, not their father. Not their father. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. I love seeing all their signatures. <laughs> Isn't that great? Let's see. Uh, this, you try to keep me from this beautiful chart. Tell me about the chart. <laughs> okay, so oh, let's talk chart. about 50s. Like I said in the beginning, I, when I discovered the family secret, I knew I was hooked. So when I say my grandfather's grandfather's family, once it's mm -hmm. laid, my grandfather's grandmother's family, uh -huh. if you look in that uh, lighter green there, that's yes. the white line. Okay. okay. So you can see a James L. Boyd. Yes. And you see the arrow and it says John McDowell, the estate of John McDowell. Yes. John McDowell is his maternal grandfather. Okay. Okay. Then you and this, is the, this is the guy who was the white guy in the 1900 census between exactly. all the black people. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Father and these black children. And then John McDowell is his grandfather. And he was his over, he was the overseer on his grandfather's plantation. Okay. Okay. And then you go to the, to the darker green and that's where you see the Binghams. Okay. And the Binghams is, are just part of his estate of 45 people. And if you look there, you can see Harriet all the way at the bottom. So Harriet's in that same category or same generation as John McDowell, Harriet McDowell. Okay. All I know is that she died before 1880. And she's Caroline's great grandmother. Uh, Caroline's grandmother. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I never heard that. You gave me two words that I did not know. Edu Educable. Educable and super Yeah, that's yeah, I never super heard annuated. That. that is a real estate term. I said, what in the world does that mean? It's a real estate term it's about a, a woman's body? Of course. Yes. Come yes. on, man. So I'm in that category. How many of you are in that category? I don't want to be in no real estate category. With exactly. Regards to my but, body. you know, they're property, not people. <laughs> I forgot. Okay. They were property. You are not superannuated. You are not property, Anita. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All right. And so that, oh my God, those were amazing. So let me see where we were in the steps. So you surveyed your county and I love family search is a great place to do a survey to figure out all the records. Whenever I get a new county, Family search, go to their catalog and like Anita did, and you could pull out these really cool records. Then you want to, you said, research all of these records. And then you said, analyze them. Anita, you are an analytical machine. I love how you analyze the, um, the draft cards and you questioned why. And it's that why that led you to this, to these questions, right? Exactly. Exactly. So right now I'm sharing a lot of the information with family. So a long time ago, I did a, a newsletter and they still have questions, but I do try to do diagrams. Like you saw that one. It seems that seems to make a lot more sense than me telling somebody begat somebody. somebody yes. Else, you know? <laughs> so the diagrams uh, really make the difference. I think when I, and I think I saw family. a Boyd on here, Melvin, you know, Melvin. Hey, Melvin, how are you? <laughs> Melvin's in California. <laughs> Melvin, yes. this is from Uncle George's family. Okay. Okay. So you are, you're doing a fabulous job, Anita. I want to run through these steps and share a little bit more about you. So let's go through all the steps of search schooling and census chasing Caroline. Step one. Interview your family. Everybody needs an Aunt Ruby. Step two, search foundational records like census, etc. Step three, survey the records for your county. Use family search. Check out your archives. Step four, you want to search for all of those records, analyze them. You see what Anita did with those draft cards. We just grab them and run. Analyze those puppies. 
And step five, you want to document and share. And of course, you want to go to Octibaha Genealogy, OKTGen.com. That's where Anita's doing her amazing work. And you want to check out one of the best genealogy groups in the country. You don't have to research Chicago. They have cool groups like, what's that group, Anita? Um, because as a member, you get all of, you get emails, right? You get access to, they send you emails all the time. All the time for different Zoom meetings. Like about that. everything that's going on in genealogy land. Absolutely. And they have cool groups like Alto. Like I was like. Forget about that. We you? have the Mississippi study group. You have the Mississippi study Alabama group. Study group too. But okay. Alto is, I said, what is Alto? And they said it's Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. I'll go with y'all acronyms. So if you are not a member of a genealogy group, join one. Anita, thank you so much for being here. Let's bring Jim back. He stayed on to check you out. <laughs> I think we, everyone, thank you so much for being here with Anita. Um, and everyone says, very interesting. Anita, thank you so much. Let's get out of here. I know how to do it right this time. Take care, everyone.